Rock Book Show. We are semi live <laughs> from Randy's Man Cave in Bordentown, New Jersey. And joining me here are the authors of No Slam Dancing, No Stage Diving, No Spikes, an oral history of the legendary City Guardians, Amy Yates Wolfing and Steve D. Lodovico. Did I say it right? Close enough. How are you saying it? D. Lodovico. See, there it is. Nice and smooth. Just rolls off the tongue. This is an amazing book. I, I've never been to City Gardens. I didn't live down here at that time in my life. But of course, now I wish I did. Um, why did you decide an oral history? Because that is not a light undertaking. Yes, if I had known what it entailed, I... If we had any clue, <laughs> we would have run screaming from, um, the, from the idea. I just love oral histories. The first time I ever read one was a book about Edie Sedgwick called Chow Edie. And that was the first time I encountered an oral history, and I loved it. Because it just made everything come alive. You have con conflicting stories. And then uh, the clincher for me was Please Kill Me, you know, the Legs McNeil book about punk rock. And I decided when I wanted to do this book, I'm doing an oral history. Because to me, it, it just really, um, you're there. You, uh, more than, a, than an editorial narrative type of thing, you really feel like you're there. Yeah. So that's why we, we chose that. And when I, when I first, when, when Amy first contacted me and started sending me pieces of the book, I had really never read an oral history myself, so I wasn't as familiar with it. And just reading the stories as they broke down and how they were told, I was like, they, they, this is it. That's, there's no better way to tell this story than when you factor in like all the different perspectives. You're covering right. many years, many genres, so you can't just have a one, two person narrative. You need to get as many voices as possible. The only way to do that is the oral history format. Yeah, it really does bring the whole thing to life. And you know, while we're here, how did you guys come together? Like all great relationships, we met over the internet. We did. <laughs> um, we didn't know each other at City Gardens. There's an age difference. I'm older than Steve, so there's enough of an age difference that we wouldn't have hung out there. Yeah. Um, we Plus, met... I was never cool enough to hang out with somebody like Amy, so mm -hmm. she would have she would have looked right past me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started working on this book. I was just toiling away and just felt like I was spinning my wheels and. Uh, at the time, there was a, a fairly active group of old city gardens people, but they were tended to be dance night people. They weren't hardcore or punk people, they were dance night. And Steve stumbled across that when he was just doing some research on city gardens for a book that he was thinking about writing. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of freelance. I was actually living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time. Um, and I was doing a little bit of freelance writing, stuff like that, and this kind of stuff I fell into was were these retrospective, let's look back at 20 years ago punk rock you're seeing. I was doing something on Philly specifically, but in telling Philly's story, I just kept remembering, oh, well, we also used to go to City Gardens a lot because there were a lot of these shows at City Gardens you couldn't go see in Philly. They just didn't come through, and I was trying to find just... Gen I didn't know that much about City Gardens. I went there a lot, but I never knew who owned it, how long it had been open, anything right. like that. And there was not much online. It's, this was before Facebook, and you know, I Google searched it kind of thing, and not much came up. And then I found this group, but like Amy said, there wasn't a lot of people in there who were familiar with the punk rock, the hardcore. But I kept getting these messages from Amy, like, email me outside of the group, I have a calendar of every City Gardens show that ever happened. I was like, okay. <laughs> and that's, we started talking and it just, one of those things where you click with a per, even without meeting, you just, right. you know, I, she kind of laid out her idea of how she wanted the book to be. And I, I said, perfect. Like I, and then I just bothered the heck out of her until she let me work on it. <laughs> and you know, the rest is history, as they Pretty say. Much, yeah. And all those great shows could not have happened without Randy now, who could, yeah. I think they broke the mold after Randy Pretty much, now. yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. I think, you know, one of the things that keeps coming up when you, when you talk about people who dealt with Randy in a professional capacity, you know, back then booking shows, I think the testament to a, 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 an honest promoter with integrity is the fact that he had so many bands that came and played multiple shows. Right. So if you have a promoter that's, you know, ripping you off, who's shady, who's unreliable, you know, you're not going to see the same bands keep coming back to play over and over. They're not going to deal with them. So I think that in itself tells you, you know, 14 plus years of booking some of the, some of these bands five six seven ten twenty times you know the Ramones kept coming back the Ramones were the Ramones they didn't have to play city guards if they didn't like what was going on so yeah and and Randy was um just a 
someone who just really loves music, even now he's just a music lover, and I think that that passion comes through. And it's what gave the club the longevity. You know, like Milo from The Descendants said, even when they rolled through major cities like Philly or New York, a lot of times they were playing a different club every time because, in, you know, the year that had passed, whatever club came and went. But City Gardens was always there. Yeah. And, so, you know, so he, he kept it going and really helped develop a reputation of being an honest promoter, someone who really cared about the bands and about the music. And the idea of, you know, let's not forget, this place was kind of in the middle of nowhere. Like, like Trenton's a major, but even for being in Trenton, it was off the beaten path. You know, you would mm -hmm. go back behind, you know, find it off this kind of road in the... It, really was in the middle of nowhere so to get these major touring bands to come through you know without the benefit of internet without the benefit of cell phones things like that it's it's amazing and that's yeah. that's why you know you need historical documents like these you know for whatever scene you're in whether it was trenton whether you were on the west coast wherever it's it's important that people know that you know this stuff hasn't been around forever there's a reason that it came about and there was a way of doing it and this is part of the way it was done. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little more because someone in your book actually said it was like an underground railroad of information of exactly. how you got things through exactly. fanzines and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah I want it, it's funny, like for me, my friends growing up, one of our like number one rules is the only good music you get, like you only take seriously the music you get from a trusted source, like mm -hmm. one of your best friends, even some zines. If you don't personally know the person that was doing that zine, you you discount their opinion. That's that's, that's how <laughs> hardcore it was. So it's a very, it was a very word of mouth network. It was a very, you know, you made friends in other cities, you traveled to other shows in, in other cities specifically to mm -hmm. just meet other people to, to help keep that and network you growing. punk rock pen pals. Yes. You would literally pals. have punk rock pen pals. Mm -hmm. oh so it's just a strange concept now, but people that you would meet or you saw that they wrote a fanzine mm -hmm. and you'd write them a letter and they would write you a letter back. and Or even people in bands. Like I have, I have a lot of friends to this day our entire friendship started with me writing a letter to a mm. P.O. box that was listed on the back of a 7-inch. That's, I have several friends like oh that. And this is, you know, 25, 30 years down the yeah. line, we're still good friends. So. And the importance of radio and record stores, too. Oh, yeah. 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 Radio, especially for me personally, um, I've told the story before. I just, like, I didn't know anything about punk rock, about metal, about hardcore. I accidentally found college radio, and I found all this crazy music. And sort of like with Amy, I started calling them and bothering, like, what's this? What's this band you're playing? And it's that guy again. Yeah, that's exact. <laughs> Don't pick up line four. To, to the point where I started just showing up at the radio station. And then, no! I mean, the people would do. They'd be like, this is my favorite college radio show. I'm going now. I'm just going to drop by. I'm just going to drop. And the one I listened to actually was in one of the scariest parts of Pennsylvania to get to. You had to drive through Chester, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like 14 years old, like trying to take a bus there. Like, oh, this is kind of neat. I had no idea what I was doing. And yeah, I, you would just, I just started showing up. Oh I'd get free records. And, and that's where I heard about shows. Yeah. I didn't know anything about shows yeah. until I was like, Oh, you can go see these bands? Okay, and cool. that's that's what started it all for me. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I used to listen to Randy's show on college radio, mm. and he would do the concert calendar, mm. and it was like all these bands that I loved playing at City Gardens, and I was like 15, like, what is this place? <laughs> exactly. I have to go exactly. there. Exactly. And I remember the first time I walked in, the place was so big that it really did impress you, like, this. This is a real club. Yeah. You would walk into a place like CBGB's and you'd be like, what is this yeah. shithole? Yeah. It, it smelled, it was small. It, I mean, it was not impressive at all, but City Gardens was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, I didn't start going to City Gardens until the late 80s, but I had been going to shows for years. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I was familiar with, you know, these these clubs were always in the worst part of town. There was always they were always filthy falling down, and even but going to City Gardens that was the huge because you know we went. I grew up going to places like Pizzazz and Revival in Philadelphia. They were tiny. The first time I walked into City Gardens, I felt like I was at an arena show. Like right. I was you know I was gonna see the Eagles or something like that. It was it was Eagles. it was bizarre to to think that like you're gonna see like seven New York hardcore bands play right. instead of you know Don Henley and those guys. Right. Um, it was huge and we yeah. definitely wasn't used to it. And after going there, and it's like. And a lot of people said it, you know, you go to see these bands that maybe you've had like like a cassette 
version of their demo that just sounded like crap and then you get to hear them through mm. a real sound system on a real stage with lights and it was very cool it was a very you know made a big impression on me yeah well you opened the book with this great story of the butthole surfers oh. show i have to tell you while i was reading the story i'm like these moms are complaining about the naked lady and not the what's no, the right. lyrics right. and the fire right. the <laughs> where are your yeah. priorities ladies and why are you bringing your son? <laughs> yes, if you're if you're that uptight about it, then why are you even taking your kid to see a band called the Butthole Surfers? That would be your first clue, the, the name of the band, yes. So what was it about this show? Uh, I mean, if you talk to Gibby from the Butthole Surfers, it was just another night yeah. for him. I mean, it was nothing special. But, I mean, for the people who went to City Gardens, it was just... You know, the the movies of penis construction, uh, reconstruction, um, you have a gory naked car women. crash videos and naked gory, women yeah, and, 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 and not like sensory overload, not like, na like a naked woman, like dancing to just she was just like, yeah, <laughs> she wasn't what you would call eye candy, really. <laughs> No, was, not, not she was candy. more there for a disturbing effect than than a titillating effect, really. And it worked, you know, it was as I. And then you couldn't get them to go home. And well, well, yeah, then, well, well, then they were doing the fire thing. And apparently, um, fire was always an issue in the place. And uh, they had had an incident with Wendy O. Williams from the Plasmatics, right. you know, going out with like a, like mm -hmm. a flamethrower. And so as soon as they saw fire, everyone was just like, fire! And, and ran and, and just, you know, pulled the... The show was pretty much over. I mean, they had played for quite a while. It wasn't like they played two songs. Mm. You know, they pulled the plug on it, but Gibby had a, you know, a bullhorn, so he's still going. The drummers are still going. The dancers are still dancing. And, uh, you know, and Gibby apparently did attempt to light a bouncer on fire. But, yeah. um, hey, it happens. It was just another night for them, but at City Gardens, it was like one of those nights that just went down in the annals. So and and I think, and, and this is one of, one of the, the big things that I kind of try and impress you know get across to people they you know you always talk about an element of danger in the music now that doesn't mean like they write lyrics that are on the that means there's danger if you go to see a show theoretically your life is in danger at any whether it's violence in the crowd whether it's the band itself lighting you anything and, and that was the thing i think that made these kinds of scenes so attractive to to people like us yeah. just to weirdos that you know you, you, here you are, you're 13, 14, 15. You really don't know anything about the world, but you just you just want whatever you what can get. Is, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> whatever you can get your hands on that's new, that doesn't belong to your parents or your older brothers. Yeah. And this element of danger, whether it's, you know, you're a kid from the suburbs going into a bad neighborhood for the first time or, you know, you go to a hardcore show and a riot breaks out. Anything. Those elements of danger, you know, people decry the violence and punk rock and hardcore and... Yeah, it sucks and it's juvenile, but it's also somewhat necessary for, yeah. for the balance. And that's, you know, that's kind of what made our scenes what they were. And what I'm also getting from the book and seeing you guys at a book signing as well is this place changed people's lives. Oh, yeah. They became who they are today or they discovered something about themselves and they met all these people who were like them. Exactly. 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 It, I mean, that was one of the things about City Gardens is so many people said this place changed me, this place set me on the you know the course that i'm on today that you know and if, and if you read the 90 cent dance night chapter we're talking about gay people black people people of every stripe every persuasion that city gardens just had this atmosphere it was like it's okay yeah whatever it's okay yeah and and i think that that non-judgmental atmosphere made people really it gave people license to do things that were very creative that they mm -hmm. might not have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. And they found people who would help them or inspire them or, or encourage them. I mean, how many, how many people formed bands just from, right. with people that they met from going to shows? How many people started writing fancy? I mean, my, I, I've never been able to play a note in my life. Like my one and only thing that I've done, you know, for the scene is I got to work on this book. So even that, 25 years later yeah. still has a huge impact on my life so and the thing is whatever creative outlet you wanted to pursue you could pursue it at city gardens people made student films that they showed there yeah. people did fanzines that they sold there people had bands that played there so whatever it was you wanted to do you could you could try it out at city gardens and the best thing was it was at a time when 
nobody was watching nobody mm -hmm. was paying attention mm -hmm. it was us and you know we got, were once we went inside whether it was a city guard wherever your scene was once you were inside the club that was your sanctuary you weren't bothered by you know the jocks at your school or your alcoholic parents or just whatever crap you dealt with in your everyday life you got inside these these the walls of these places and either like it was the the music was so good it got you off or or you know you see your friends that so a lot of times are closer to you than blood relatives and that's mm -hmm. that's what's lasting that's what's enduring about yeah. a place and like a city guard guys who went there had a lot of pent up aggression that they well, were no, able to of course uh, of course <laughs> to, to let you know in a let it go in the mosh pit rather yeah. than get into a fight but yeah there was no nobody was paying attention to what yeah. we were doing we just we did whatever the hell we want you had a guy like randy he could book whatever he wanted you know there, there was no there were no outside influences being like all right you have to make this much money you right. have to book this you have to do this like randy will tell you how many shows they took a bath on mm -hmm. you know just because the love of music right. and they wanted to put the show on mm -hmm. I've got uh, I picked two stories from the book for each of you I'll let you pick which one you want to tell or talk about for Amy um, I picked the Devo story and the flipper story nice <laughs> nice oh yeah it's like yeah I was going to see Devo and I, I walk into 7-Eleven it's like oh my god there he is that's him that's him Cause my love of nerds you yeah. know just but mark Mothersbaugh was the ultimate nerd and he's standing there with two hot dogs <laughs> and there you two, are yeah two two-fisted hot dogs in 7-eleven and it was just like wow <laughs> all your dreams came true the flipper story yeah. is um you beat up flipper <laughs> she kicked their ass right in the nuts yeah um, no, Flipper had, if you talk to anybody who was played with Flipper, you really had to watch your equipment because they would steal it. They were notorious drug addicts. They were always getting arrested. They were always getting into fight. They were just Flipper. So um, I went to go interview Flipper for the fanzine that I had at the time. And again, they tried to steal the opening band's equipment. Um, we know what else is new and they were just being kind of kind of jerky and so the, it was me and another woman and she's made a crack about them you know well yeah I guess you guys are kind of busy trying to steal somebody else's equipment to do this <clears> interview <throat> and like all hell broke loose and you know it's just one of those things where it all happens so fast and the next like when it's all over you're like did I just punch a guy from flipper in the nuts because he had me by the hair trying to throw me down steps yeah I think that happened I think that happened, <laughs> I think that did happen. <laughs> And, and the bottom line is, as the line states, there's no crying in punk rock. There's no crying in punk rock. And when I, I tried to tell my mother about it, she's like, well, what were you doing there yeah, anyway? You should have known better. You should have known better. Yeah. Something you would tell your own daughter nowadays. Yeah. And for you, if you wouldn't mind explaining the wall of death oh, and wall of death. your extreme love for dancing. <laughs> um, my, my, my relationship with Mr. Danzig is very complicated. <laughs> Um, as is everyone. As is everyone's. <laughs> um, when I was but a young, impressionable metalhead who knew nothing of the world but Slayer and Venom and things like that, through college radio, through the radio station I hung out with, I found this record called Walk Among Us. And I had really never heard music like that. I had heard the Ramones, but honestly, I, like I was past the Ramones. That that By the time I got into music, the Ramones was kind of... They were old men. They, well, it wasn't even that. It was soft rock. It was like, you know, it was very melodic. You didn't Poppy, hear. Yeah. So, but here you had the misfits who were poppy like that, but they were singing about Martians and, and, and skulls. And it was, it was perfect. <laughs> loved it. I loved it more than... My life became just a series of trips through Philadelphia and New Jersey trying to find any misfits records I could. <laughs> the real ones. I bought all the bootlegs, so I'd have them to play, but track and I had a friend and Spina is her name and her and I that was our thing we would look for misfits records and she would find them and I'd get real mad that she and I'd be like I got this one and so I love them and I love Sam Hain and I chose not to listen to the stories that I had heard of Mr. Danzig's personality and whatnot and a little mercurial but I, I, I finally got the chance. I was too young to see the Misfits when they, when they were playing, but I got the chance to see Danzig play his very first show as the band Danzig. 
And I will say this, as someone, I've met him on two separate occasions as a fan. Both times, he was extremely cool. He was very nice. We went to City Gardens. We had never been there before. We had no idea what we were doing. You know, got lost on the way. It was me and another dude. Got there late, saw like the last half of the show. I had no idea. For years, I never knew that Guar even opened that show until somebody told me later. Uh, caught the encore, went around back, which is the scariest part of City Gardens. It's just, just pitch blackness in a junkyard. It was next to a junkyard, yeah. So I went out back and I and I had some records and I had the the requisite um, you know punker leather jacket that was all painted up and everything. And on it, I had a giant misfit skull and it. I think it said evil never dies. So I got, I got my turn to meet Glenn. And he's signing my records and he's like. Come here, man. And he signs. I had these like shredded rocker jeans. Oh, yes, of course you did. And he signs, <laughs> evil is dot, 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 Glenn Dancy. <laughs> and he signed in like red permanent marker. I went home and I cut the thing out. I wore the jeans a couple more times. Right. Then when it was, when they had to be washed, I cut the thing out and I put a little thing on my wall with all my flyers and everything. And so, yeah, I had a love affair with Glenn Danzig. Do you still have that? I do not. Oh. I do not. Because then you, then you grow up and you realize how corny he is. And, you know, he's this, like, four-foot midget singing like he's the devil. And he's not scary at all. He re And now you see him, you know, and he's a little bloated. And he's a little... He's not very scary. But he's still trying to rock the leather vest. Right. With and, the, yeah. and the sex symbolness. And, yeah, it just doesn't work. But the Wall of Death... Um, that's that's a hardcore thing. That's that's a hardcore show. Um, I don't know that it was limited to strictly city gardens. I've seen it in other places, but only like East Coast places. And it's just this dumb thing where meathead dudes like start at the back of a club like this, and everybody just run. Basically, it was a way to clear out the pit when the pit was getting too clogged up. People weren't moving right, or you just you know you needed space. You kind of. And it was never like, a, okay, at this time we're getting together for the wall. It's just <laughs> one of those like sense things. Like you just yeah. look around, like like when a fight's about to happen, you just know that yeah. it is. Yeah. And a couple looks around the room, it's like, all right, everybody come back and you line up and you just <laughs> run. And, and yeah. that's the wall of death. That's the wall of death. Did you, either of you have any idea during that time that this was going to be something? No. No, no I would have took more no. pictures. <laughs> Honestly, I would have taken pictures. I would have taken notes. I would have, you know, I would have documented every move that I made. Yeah, but yeah. You, you think you're living in the moment. Right, you're not. Exactly. It's not like today where, you know, you have to have your phone out and taking pictures of stuff mm -hmm. rather than actually experience mm -hmm. it. I mean, back then, you went to shows because that's what you did. You didn't ever think that the bands would change, the music would change, or that yeah. you would get old. Well, that's, that's the curse of youth, is you just take everything for granted. Yeah. You know, of course this place is always going to be here. And of right. course these bands, yeah. of course the Ramones are going to come back in six months of and play course. again. <laughs> this can't be the last show. Yeah. And of course, you know, um, these bands, we're, we're always going to be around. We're always going to be friends. These bands will always play. This club will always be here. We'll never have to grow up and get jobs and pay bills. Yeah. We'll always live at mom's house. Yeah. yeah. Or Sim's mom. Yeah. Yeah. Or something, or mom. you know. Yeah. Or I'm just going to get famous and be a rock star and not have to worry about any of this stuff you know yeah. Exactly. yeah so what is next on your adult agenda yeah. well for me it's to get a job because i actually still don't have a job um amy and i actually have a second book in the works that we already did start on and we're actually very anxious to get back to working on cool. yeah it's yeah. another oral history we didn't learn our lesson the first time around yeah. apparently no, no. yes no we're and gluttons for punishment. But for glutton, and it's about um, a record, about record stores. Yeah, so. and we kind of want to tell the history of the American record store, not just as an industry, but like personalize yeah, it. Yeah, more. Uh, there's a million books out there about the business right. and the mafia and blah blah blah, and and that's somebody else's story. We want to talk about the people who work there and went there. So. Yeah, and and all the wacky stories that you have, and and the classic characters that come through record stores and also you know a lot of a lot of really cool stuff you know little scenes and whatnot sprang up from record stores you know, so i mean there's a lot there um like i said we've really only just kind of scratched the surface and you know like even with the city gardens book you really don't know where the story is going to go it, mm. it's you know where the people take you where the interviews take you so i mean we have an idea but you never know. You never know. I mean, yeah. people, I mean, the books, people talk and 
the story becomes what it's meant to exactly. be. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, you find all kinds of different paths. You talk to one person, a lot of times it leads to six or seven other right. connections. Oh, you have to talk to this person. They've got great stories. And it just, it veers off into a place that you might not have even visualized it going in the first place. But it ends up working for whatever reason, right. you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. again, I think kind of like City Gardens and, you know, the punk rock and hardcore scene of that era, it needs to be preserved. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. It needs to be preserved. Yeah. So. Um, so before we go, we talked about the sights, the sounds of City Gardens. Is there a smell that you remember distinctly? Oh, God, <laughs> yes. yeah. Well, there's... What season are we talking about? Well, there's... Well, first and of all... where are you standing? <laughs> first of all, there's, there's the universal smell of shows that's just... A musky, adolescent male frustration, sweat, gnarly, not Fair showered, wounds. crust punk, yes, kind of <laughs> thing. But also, so I think each individual and place for women it was hairspray. Oh God, yeah, hairspray. And I think each individual place kind of took on its own memory type smell. I guess, like, yeah. like I know I remember Revival always had it distinct smell to itself most of that were the clothes cigarettes yeah, yeah. that the goth girls would smoke oh, yeah. city gardens was always bathrooms to me bathrooms and mail yeah. uh, the beer, smell of mail beer and and if it was summer and you had oh. the misfortune of being near the men's room oh. pee. yeah beer and pee oh, <laughs> punk rock is not supposed to look pretty nor is it supposed to That's smell like good we talking about the cbgb's movie everyone looked right, too right. exactly Nothing looked like it smelled exactly yeah, yeah. So there's no crying in punk rock, but there's a hell of a lot of smells. Exactly. <laughs> and the smells can make you cry <laughs> on a good night.